here lies an empire, a crumbling ruin that was once a cattle ranch, a rodeo ground, an experimental farm, a circus, a movie studio, and a racetrack for turtles, the place known all over the world as Oklahoma's 101. It was 1879. Northern Oklahoma was a six million acre pasture called the Cherokee Strip, where the grass was so thick you could pitch your hat in any direction and never hit the ground. Into this land came George W. Miller, rancher, Confederate veteran, family man. George Miller leased 100,000 acres of grazing land from the Cherokees, drove his herds up from Texas, made them fat, and shipped them east. With George Miller came three sons. George Jr., regarded as a financial genius, respected for his ability to be at home with anyone, cowboy or queen. The second son was Joe Miller, gentleman farmer in the plantation tradition, a natural horticulturist and a gracious host. And Zach Miller, the third son. With no interest in farming or finance, Zach was a born cowman, natural trader, expert horseman. These were the Miller brothers. When their father died at the turn of the century, the 101 ranch belonged to them. As George Miller died, the great ranches were dying too. The strip was open to settlers in 1893 and gradually the cowmen were forced out. The 101 herds moved out too, but they went only as far as the Ponca Indian Reservation near Ponca City. From the Indians, the Millers leased 100,000 acres for one cent an acre a year. The Poncas repaid an old friendship with the Millers, and the 101 survived, the last of the great ranches. Now the railroad came right to the ranch door. The big drives were over, the trails fenced. The tough old longhorns that could walk from Texas to Kansas went out of style. In their place, the Miller brothers bought new purebreds, shorthorns, Herefords. They experimented with their own breeds, crossing Brema cows with buffalo bulls to produce drought-resistant cattle. Though the range was fenced, this was still ranching on a grand scale. Cowboys still rounded up the cattle, as many as 36,000 a year. Just to be the last of the great Oklahoma ranches would have made the 101 famous, but that was far too small an accomplishment for the three Miller brothers. They were all showmen in the Barnum tradition, and they were just preparing to entertain the world. <laughs> On the banks of the Salt Fork River, just south of Ponca City, the Millers built their headquarters, a gracious mansion known everywhere as the White House. Inside, walnut panels gleamed with a vast collection of Western and pioneer relics. Giant trees shaded the lawns and stately gates opened for visitors who seemed to be always arriving. They saw much more than a ranch, for the genius of the Millers had turned the 101 into the largest diversified farm in the world. On every side, new fields blossom from the incredibly rich Salt Fork bottomland. 7,500 acres of corn bore 75,000 bushels. 8,000 acres of wheat brought yields of 50,000 bushels. There was row upon row of the latest farming machinery. And there was more. For the ranch still preserved the life of the cowboy, the color of the Indians, the legend of what had once been the West, the great American dream. The dream was a self-sufficient community. They built their own roads, their own bridges. They started their own personal flood control program. The ranch had its own power plant, its own telephone system, meat packing plant, and cannery. They even minted their own money called Bronx and good for anything in the ranch store. The more diverse the ranch became, the stranger was the view from the White House. Soon the pastures held herds of buffalo, then camels, and casual motorists were flabbergasted to see elephants herded by cowboys while feathered Indians watched from teepees. The whole place was unbelievable, but there it was. It seemed that whatever Colonel Joe planted on the 101 prospered. 
He bought a carload of stranded apple trees for two cents each and soon had an orchard producing 40,000 bushels. In nine years, the ranch made $75,000 from Joe's two cent trees with a cider plant producing 200 barrels a year and an apple jelly plant. Without missing a trick, the Millers declared a special Apple Blossom Day each year and invited the public to come and gaze in wonder at the beauty of 6,000 apple trees in full blossom. The graves of five cowboys are on this hill, but the only one with a tombstone belongs to a Negro named Bill Pickett. It stands as a monument one of the great rodeo performers of all time. Breaking horses and roping cattle was such an everyday chore that no one gave it much thought. Bill Pickett made a game out of throwing the tough longhorns around, and he invented the sport of bulldogging, encouraging the steer to cooperate by sinking his teeth into its nose. In 1905, the Millers gave a roundup performance for a convention of the National Editorial Association. They drew the biggest crowd in territorial history, 50,000 persons. Special trains came from as far away as Kansas City and Dallas, and the railroads were so jammed it was impossible to get a train out of Ponca City for days. That was all the signal the Millers needed. They built their own roundup arena. They always preferred the word roundup to rodeo and into their arena they paraded some of the most unusual entertainment extravaganzas ever seen. Colonel Joe Miller rode with the show on an $8,000 saddle mounted with diamonds, sapphires, and rubies, often surrounded by the surviving cowboys of the Cherokee Strip. The riders received their rewards, but the Miller brothers received even greater ones. With the roundups came a deluge of visitors, 100,000 a year, not including the roundup attendants. To the great and the near great, the doors of the White House were always open, the Miller hospitality always available. No Oklahoma building ever hosted such a wonderful assortment of visitors as did the stately White House. Admiral Richard Byrd was photographed atop an elephant. John Philip Sousa became a Ponca Indian. Mary Roberts Reinhardt came to gather background for a book. Teddy Roosevelt was delighted. The guest list read like a cross-section of who's who. Nancy Astor, John Ringling, William Randolph Hearst, Irvin Cobb, Rex Beach, William Allen White, Charles Curtis, John D. Rockefeller Jr., Warren Harding. Cartoonist Sidney Smith drew Andy Gump on a White House wall and had an oil well named after him. All came and all were enchanted by the 101. Kids were there too. Orphans, Boy Scouts, underprivileged, all hoping that they might someday grow up to be cowboys for the 101. They saw the buffalo, last of the millions which once roamed the ranch. Some were there when Geronimo, the wily Apache, was brought up from imprisonment at Fort Sill to shoot his last buffalo. Aged and infirm, wearing a top hat, he stood in an automobile to fire his rifle. But the years had caught Geronimo. Though he hit the buffalo, another hunter had to finish the kill. But it was the Indians who were the biggest curiosity for the ranch visitors, and it was no accident that there were always plenty of Indians around when the Miller brothers needed them. George Miller Sr. had befriended the Ponca tribe when its friends were very few. He helped them obtain their Salt Fork land after the whites forced them out of Nebraska, 
and the Miller brothers continued their father's kindnesses. When distinguished visitors wished to see a genuine red man, a village would arise on the White House lawn. And when some action was desired, the young men would strip to the waist, take up their sticks, and flail away in a game of Indian stickball. Certainly the roughest, wildest, most dangerous game since the gladiators. The Millers were grateful. By their word, no Indian ever went hungry or cold or sick, if the Millers knew it. Among the ruins that are now the 101 Ranch, this leaning stone tower is the most unique. It stands alone a few miles from the White House, built by the Miller brothers as a monument to Chief White Eagle, leader of the Ponca tribe and longtime friend of the 101. On top of the tower stands a white eagle, headless now, a white eagle which once stood on top of a gasoline pump for white eagle gas. But it was the sentiment, not the source, that pleased the Ponkas. On the day when Chief White Eagle's monument was dedicated, there was a colorful celebration at Boot Hill. The photographer recorded a rare day in Oklahoma history when he made these films, for many of these Ponkas have, like the 101 Ranch, gone from Oklahoma forever. brothers were honorary members of the Ponca tribe, and when Colonel Joe Miller returned to the ranch with a new bride, the Indians provided them with a traditional Indian marriage ceremony in addition to their more familiar vows. The Indian wedding required that the bride go with her husband into a tent, thus announcing her willingness to join with him. After tribal ritual, the couple emerged and provided with blankets and other necessities of Indian life, officially became man and wife. In 1913, the show paid $6 a week for braves, $2.50 for squaws, while chiefs and interpreters drew $8 apiece. The Millers contracted with trading posts and Indian agents for the show, ranging as far as North Dakota for participants willing to travel. Travel was required. Demand for a taste of the Old West had forced the show on the road. In later years, the youngsters and their parents would relive the Old West in movie houses or in front of television sets. But in the early 1900s, the only place was the Wild West show. The official title of the roundup was changed. Now it was the Miller Brothers 101 Ranch Real Wild West and Great Far East Show. Each spring, the ranch started its change of character. From the far ends of the nation, performers started arriving. Indians came in from the north, cowboys from the west. There were stunt riders, trick ropers, sharpshooters. All the circus animals came too, for the Miller Brothers had combined their Wild West show with the circus and formed something different in show business. It was a strange combination. For weeks, the acts worked out in the ranch arenas, polishing, practicing, getting ready. Cowgirls put ponies through their paces. Stage coaches were ambushed by fierce Indians. Ox carts and wagon trains rumbled around the track while monkeys and lions screamed from their cages. Oklahomans stopped by in large numbers to look at and wonder on all these activities. They shook their heads in amazement while Elephant went on teeter-tottering on the Oklahoma plains.
The show had real cowboys, of course. The Millers helped organize the Cherokee Strip Cowpunchers Association, seen here at one of the show performances. These men were the survivors of those who once herded cattle in the old Cherokee Strip, before it was settled, fenced, and civilized forever. This particular group was photographed in the late 1920s, before time removed so many of these real cowboys from the West they'd helped to build. After spring training, the show was ready to go. And when the great, ponderous, improbable collection of men, animals, and equipment was finally assembled, they hit the road for the season. The show now spread more than five acres of tents and traveled in 40 railroad cars. It took 1,700 people to put on the performances. The Millers boasted that it was entirely the product of the ranch. Ranch mechanics built the bleachers out of wood owned by the Millers. Cotton grown on the ranch was used to weave the tents. Even food for the mess hall tables came from the 101. 30,000 pounds of it by refrigerator car every 10 days. These were the days of the great circuses and the infighting was often dirty. Schedules were juggled to put one show just ahead of its competitor. Posters were covered up or torn down. At one point, Zack managed to convince the governor of Virginia that Ringling Brothers was infested with hoof and mouth disease. The governor quarantined Ringling, leaving the Virginia circuit wide open for the 101. But more often, it was the competition which won and the Millers who suffered. Bad weather and accidents hampered the show and year after year it failed to show a profit. But it stayed on the road year after year. Hollywood is a long, long way from the remains of the 101 Ranch, and probably no movie cowboy could tell you today what the ranch was or where it is. Yet here is where the movie Western was born and nurtured to maturity. The Miller brothers started their movie-making career in what is now Hollywood. In fact, they're credited with being the first to make films there while wintering the show. Later, whole movie companies were transported to the ranch to film Western spectaculars including this recreation of the run of 89, complete with the original cast. The early movies had plenty of material to film. There were stirring stories of outlaw battles, killings and captures, and in many cases the original settings and even the original heroes were still available to the producers. Such famous stars as Buck Jones, William S. Hart, Hoot Gibson and Tom Mix were Miller cowhands at one time or another. And here, Marshal Bill Tillman fights a cutthroat band. many roundups, but none as strange as the annual Terrapin Roundup, staged by the Miller brothers. From the thousands of little land turtles on the ranch, the Millers conceived the idea of a Terrapin Derby, and then built it up as only the Millers could. They sent cowboys out to bring in the Terrapins by the sack full. At ranch headquarters, other men waited to number each Terrapin and enter him in the sweepstakes. On Derby Day, Oklahomans turned out by the thousands and bet on their numbered steed. The first Derby was held in 1924, and they grew every year until one editor was suggesting that the whole event be moved to the state fairgrounds. <laughs> The whole event looked like a burlesque of the Kentucky Derby. The miniature steeds were paraded before post time on wagons with white-coated grooms in careful attendance. The ranch gave all its pageantry to the parade, and in this case, imported a senator to preside. The traditional racetrack was modified somewhat to fit the confused running habits of a terrapin. The race started from a large circle in the middle of the field. 
The fiery steeds were shoveled into baskets and transported by their handlers to the center circle. The crowd waited with something like breathless anticipation. The biggest problem was getting the steeds right side up, but then all jockeys have problems. And since every Terrapin represented somebody's two dollars, they all had to have an equal start in the interest of good sportsmanship. Wandering across the track, the noble animals strained every muscle. Those fortunate enough to be first across the finish line, in this case the outside circle, were in the money. This time, the sturdy little terrapin carried $4,500 to win. It was recorded that M.W. Gaffey of Ponca City won. Mr. Gaffey announced that he would use the windfall to pay off his mortgage and get married again. The slow death of the Great 101 Ranch began with the death of Colonel Joe in 1927. They found him in the ranch garage, a victim of carbon monoxide. In his will was a $1,000 gift to the Ponca Indians to provide for the traditional memorial service. More than a thousand Indians gathered for the rites where the personal belongings of the deceased were distributed among his friends according to Indian custom. Two years later, in the winter of 1929, George Miller was killed in an automobile accident while returning to the ranch. The last services for George Miller also drew a large crowd to the ranch. Crowds were expected at the 101. There had been many over the years. People had come by the thousands to watch the roundups, to thrill to the apple blossoms and to the circus. Thousands more had laughed at the improbable Terrapin Derby. But this was an audience for sorrow, one emotion that had always been foreign to the 101. A long line followed the casket into Ponca City. It was a bleak day for the great ranch, bleaker than the patches of winter snow which spotted the frozen ground. genial host and horticulturist, and George, the financial wizard, indispensable money manager who had always been able to pay off the big loans and get more to take their place. The two brothers who wrote such an amazing chapter in the history of their state were buried in a family plot in the Ponca City Cemetery. Zach Miller tried to carry on, but it was too late. He was hit by the depression, Crops failed, thousands of dollars in mortgages came due. Zach tried to save the ranch with the show, but he was hounded by bad weather, poor attendance, accidents, and hungry lawyers. The Miller Brothers' real Wild West and Great Far East show lost $2,500 a day and finally went broke in Washington, D.C. There came a day when Zach, alone in the White House, tried to stand off his creditors with a gun, but it was no use. A judge ordered him jailed. Governor Murray dispatched the National Guard and set him free, but troops could not save the ranch. It took four auctioneers working all one dusty day to dismember the last of the 101. Everything went, even the buffalo. Through it all, Zack stayed in the White House, hidden from the curious crowds. And then, two hours before a sundown deadline, the last of the Miller brothers left the ranch. Through the 30s, the White House gradually rotted away. Finally, during World War II, it was demolished and the materials sold. Only the foundation and concrete vault survived the wrecking hammers. Zach Miller lived on, 
a broken, unhappy man until he died in 1949. He asked to be buried on a hill beside the salt fork, looking north over the heart of the 101 Ranch. And that's where he is today.